Well, thank you very much for that, uh, that welcome and that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, that was one of the most creative ways I've ever been introduced before, by standing on your own grave. Uh, good heavens. Um, that's confidence right there. Um, it's an honor to be with you, and I'll, let me tell you, it's an honor uh, doubly because uh, my speaking here at New Hope is the first time I've spoken to a live audience in person uh, in four months. Um, now, yeah, so thank you. <clears throat> I've spoken numerous times now, in fact, uh, probably more times in the past four months than I've spoken in any four-month period during my entire uh, ministry because you get to do things like I get to speak to a church in Texas on a Sunday morning and then that same Sunday, uh, Sunday morning for me, but Sunday evening for them, I speak to a group of businessmen in Singapore on the same day because of the wonders of technology. But I will tell you, I am very, very tired of preaching to the little green dot that is the camera on my computer. Um, and I'm very happy to see you all here and hear some level of response. Um, uh, a live audience is a good thing. Hopefully you're more live than the eight o'clock. I'm kidding, the eight o'clock service was great. No, they were great, I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding. Don't show them this tape. Um, tape, like as if we're in the 1950s or something. Um, as I speak to you this morning, by the way, I wanted to make, make a comment just really quick. It struck me as I was sitting there. I didn't say anything during the first service, but I really should have, is the very fact that this church will bring people from other churches to lead in worship, which is one of the most integral parts of the church service, and feel no hint or worry or care about whether or not someone might say, you know what, I want to go to that person's church or whatever it is. That's a testimony to the power of being a church without walls. That is quite literally the embodiment of that song they just sang. <clears throat> and I want to thank Pastor Craig and the, Pat, the staff here for having me at New Hope. What a blessing and an honor to come back. Thank you so much. As I begin, I think about 2020, and you know, uh, many sermons nowadays in the past few months have talked about 2020. Um, and you remember what the sermons were about in January of 2020? They were about vision, clear vision for the future. And what was 2020 going to show us and reveal to us? And everyone had grand plans for 2020. This was the, the year where God was going to show us what he wants us to do and who we need to be and how we can do wonderful things. It wasn't just the church, by the way. It was captains of industry who were saying, 2020 is the year where thus and such a company will move forward in so many wonderful ways and we'll see amazing things. And then the Australian wildfires happened. Remember those? Um, then the, uh, of course, COVID-19 and the lockdown and all the shutdown, and we had these uh, extremely myopic views of the world that were limited to 4.3 inch squares of our, you know, uh, on our, in our hands. And then, of course, all the civil unrest and the racial injustice we're seeing around the, around the country, even around the world, we're seeing it wake up in a certain way. And we think all of this upheaval and all of this strife and all this turmoil has now clouded our judgment and clouded our sight. We can't see anything. We thought it would be a year of vision, and now it's been ruined. May I suggest to you the opposite is actually the case? that we are seeing clearer now than we've ever seen. Maybe we're seeing things we should have seen before, but Amen. didn't. And 2020 is that year where God is actually using, not causing, but using strife, upheaval, and all of this to show us who we need to be and the world around us as it is. Amen. Now I say that in conjunction with my message today because it is a fresh look at history's most influential figure. It's based on a book that Ravi Zacharias and I wrote uh, called Seeing Jesus from the East. It's available in the lobby. Um, it is an honor, it was an honor to write this book with Ravi. I, you know, as many of you may know, as the senior vice president with RZIM, Ravi's ministry, I traveled all over the globe with him and I stood on stage at Michigan, not, sorry, not Michigan State University, I did that. But I stood on stage at Miami University uh, back in February with Ravi for an open forum. I think it was 7,000 plus people in that university stadium. And it was his last ever public speaking engagement because he passed away sadly uh, not long ago, uh, succumbing to sarcoma after a short fight with it. And it's still hard for me to believe that he's gone. But his voice lives in the pages of that book. We had the blessing of filming a video curriculum together in the East where we talked about the, the ideas of being an Eastern Christian, me from the Middle East, him from the East, and what that actually means to us and how it applies today to the West. And so what I wanna to say to you is this, if we can have 2020 vision 
of what's going on in our culture, maybe we ought to have a sharper vision, a fresher look at history's most influential figure. And it is beyond doubting, it is beyond debating. I don't care what worldview you come from, Christian or otherwise, that the single most important historical and influential figure ever was Jesus Christ, who only walked on this earth for three years and yet changed for millennia. That's effective and influential. The reason why we need to get a fresh look at Jesus is because I think in our culture today, especially with what's going on now, is we're getting a sense of a false view of who Jesus actually is. And there is a false narrative being told to you and to me, and sometimes we perpetuate it too, about who Jesus actually is. We see him now, especially in the West, as an icon of white Western imperialistic religion used by white Western imperialists and colonists to impose their views on dark skinned people and women. This is the narrative that's being told now. And we even see it in some of our images and our iconography when we see paintings of Jesus and all this kind of thing. And so sometimes we actually perpetuate it as well. But can I say to you this? When you look at Jesus afresh in the pages of the scriptures, in the pages of history, you don't see that Jesus is the icon of white imperialism where the West influences the East or the South. You see exactly the opposite of the cultural flow. You see a Middle Easterner whose olive skin, who didn't eat hot dogs and, and hamburgers and drench things in mayo or whatever it is. Rather, he ate hummus and he ate the pita breads that were soaked in the olive oil and the cumins and the spices of his area. And he spoke from the Eastern perspective into the West, influenced the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, for the better. The idea of equality was not born in the Roman Empire in the halls of philosophy of the Greeks. No, the idea of equality was born on Calvary's Hill in, a, in, a, in an outpost of the Roman Empire. Everyone had forgotten, but the one man who is the incarnation of God himself, can, can do something on a hill that no one ever heard of and change the Roman Empire so that the idea of human equality is born. Where does that idea come from? It comes from the idea of the scriptures that tell you and tell me that we're all equally made in God's image, yet we are all equally sinners and we are all equally offered redemption because Christ so loved the world. So quite opposite of what the culture wants to tell you, Christianity is not, Christendom may be, but Christianity itself is not the cause of all the world's ills. In fact, can I suggest this to you in many ways, and we go through this in the book and in other places as well. Christianity, the, 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 belief, the, the, the gospel message, the person of Christ, isn't the cause of the problems. I do think he's the solution. And I think we can sustain that. Let me sustain that for you today and show you why I think that's the case. So we need to get a fresh perspective of Jesus because the culture is telling us the opposite of what's reality. We need to stand up, not in a defiant, shake-fisty way, but in a loving, kind tone and show them the truth. You stand up for your convictions without being overly bombastic about it and you can show the truth and the love and the beauty of Christ. But you speak to the, the culture today with a certain amount of risk because we're no longer in engaged in a culture where you can have an argument, you can make a statement and you can have facts behind you and they will engage with you. Even if they don't agree with you, they'll engage in counter argument and counter perspectives and apply the same facts but say, here's why my position is correct. We used to do that. We used to engage in actual debate. We no longer do that. Now we are engaged in what has been deemed the cancel culture. The cancel culture. Now, <clears throat> looking around the room, I can tell that from the ages of the people in the room, there are some people who know what I'm talking about. You're social media savvy, you're younger than me, and you know what a cancel culture actually is. I can tell from looking around the room that some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, um, <clears throat> about what a cancel culture actually is. Uh, but let me suggest this to you, okay? Let me just describe what a cancel culture actually is. The cancel culture is a culture where we no longer can tolerate any viewpoints that go against what's been socially accepted as the norm. So we have certain politically correct ideas, we have certain politically expedient ideas about gender, about sexuality, about all kinds of things, uh, politics, you name it, and these become the socially accepted, culturally enforced 
moral norms. And if you happen to say something that goes against any of these things, no matter what level of influence you have, you can be the biggest rock star there is, you can be a movie star, you can be an author, you can be a politician, you can be uh, anybody, you can be a soccer mom, you can be a soccer dad, whatever it is, no matter what level of influence you have, if you say something that goes against what the current power structure and culture says is the right thing, they will not engage in debate. They will cancel you, which means they will throw every post they can online, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, they'll throw it at you and it'll be the most vile, disgusting, ugly language you ever heard. And they will call people to boycott your books, to stop seeing your movies, to stop watching you play basketball, to whatever it might be. They will boycott you because you are canceled. We don't want to hear it from you. And here is the effect. It stults speech. It completely gets rid of speech altogether because everyone is terrified of becoming canceled. This seems like a new phenomenon, doesn't it? But can I suggest something to you? It's actually very old. It's at least 2,000 years old. And you know who invented it? It wasn't the West. It was my people, the Middle East. You're welcome. <laughs> When you look at the way that the culture that Jesus actually worked, administered, died and rose again in, you see it very eerily similar to a cancel culture. So missiologists, people who study missions, will, and even sociologists, by the way, will break up the world into different kinds of cultures based on how they affect and um, enforce morality. So we in the West are what's called an innocence guilt culture. <clears throat> Here's why. In the West, we, we value our individualism. You know, you have the right to believe, to think, to say, and to act in whatever way you want, short of inf you know, violating someone else's rights. But you have an individual right. We have a, a belief in the individual. And it's great because it fosters innovation, it fosters all kind of strong work ethic, and you break down barriers, and you, you know, you, you're pioneering and frontiering going on in that kind of a culture, and it's wonderful. But like everything, it's got a shadow side to it. And the shadow side of rampant individualism is that people act, believe, and say things without considering how they affect other people because the individual is the most important thing. And so sometimes we forget our societal impact on other people. But where the morality comes in is this. Because we're so individualistic, if I do something wrong, if I go against what the culture says is right or wrong, and I do something wrong, I have an individualistic internal sense of wrong and right. And so my conscience is pricked a little bit and I think to myself, you know what, I've done something wrong. It's gnawing at me, I lose a little sleep over it. I need to go apologize to that person. I need to do something to make up for what I've done because I was innocent, then I became guilty and I need to be innocent again. And in order to do that, I need to pay my debt to the other person and therefore I will be made right. That's an individualistic sense of morality. In the East, it's different. In the East, they don't have an innocence and guilt culture, they have an honor-shame culture. An honor-shame culture values the collective. So no one individual is, is, is more important than the group. So in a family, for example, if I'm in a family and I do something that is laudable, that is good and, and noble, and honorable in the sight of the culture, my family automatically gets all the honor that I had as well. If I do something good, they are deemed to be good people and they have the benefit of the honor. But if I do something shameful, not only am I shamed, but they're shamed as well because it reflects upon them. And so what the individual does in an Eastern honor and shame culture is he's constantly or she's constantly thinking about what they do and how it's perceived by their culture. Is what I do, say, or believe honorable in the culture's eyes or is it shameful in the culture's eyes? Now that has a good aspect to it because you do care about what other people think. You do care about the welfare of other people and so you don't just act in your own self-interest, you act in the interest of others. That's good. The shadow side to that is that oftentimes you will believe even a lie that you know to be false because the culture deems it honorable. 
and so you will walk away from the truth. That's the culture Jesus worked in, a culture that valued the collective at the expense of the individual. We live in a culture that values the individual at the expense of the collective. And somehow, the Lord of glory, the Lord of the word, the God made flesh, who is God, the word made flesh, allows his words to transcend both of those cultures at the same time, and in fact, transcend first century. He speaks first century, and he speaks 2020 quite well. How do I know this? What is the cancel culture? The cancel culture is an honor and shame culture. It says, if you say something that violates what the collective thinks is right, we won't engage in debate. We will shame you out of existence. We will silence you. That is what honor, shame cultures do. If you happen to change your worldview from the religion of the culture you're from in the East and in the Middle East, it's a tremendous shame. Even if what you change to is true, it doesn't matter. You violated the norms. You've betrayed everybody you love. And then we will ostracize you and get rid of you. Not always, but it does happen. That's what the, cult, the cancel culture does. It's exactly what it does. Exactly. Now here's the key, okay? This is important. In an honor and shame culture, when you do something wrong, it's not like the West. In the West, if you do something wrong, you can do something right to fix it. In an honor and shame culture, you don't do something wrong, you have done something shameful. And when you do something shameful, you have become a shameful person. You don't do something wrong, you become someone bad. Which means you need an identity change to fix you in the culture's eyes. It is no accident then that the gospel is not about making bad people good, as Ravi has often said. It's about making dead people live. And that is an identity shift, all in its own. Let me give you an example of how much the West is looking like an honor and shame culture in the cancel milieu we're living in now. J.K. Rowling is an extremely popular author. Many of you will know her from authoring the very popular Harry Potter series of books. And she's written other books as well. She's, I think she's a billionaire now from all the books she sold. Wildly popular. As far as I understand, her politics are sort of left of center and all these things, and that's fine, whatever. But I'll tell you this, she made a statement, maybe you know the story, she made a statement a couple of weeks ago, maybe even a month or so ago, about how she actually believes that male and female are not social constructs, but there is an actual reality, a physical, medical, biological reality to being male and to being female. Now, you can already tell where this is going. This goes against the cultural norm of saying, no, those are, those are completely social constructs and we can have a fluidity and all this stuff. And that goes against what people are saying. So what did they do with this extremely popular, very influential, well, almost, well-loved all over the world author? What did they do? Did they engage in debate and said, hmm, Mrs. Rowling, please tell us what your, your view is on this. No, they didn't do that. They canceled her. The number of tweets, the number of posts on the various social media that came her way that were vile, disgusting, even death threats that came her way were unbelievably, were an avalanche of horrors for her. But she stuck to her guns and she kept on saying what she was saying and all these things. And so what they did was say, we'll just stop buying her books. Even some of the actors, I believe, what happened was some of the actors who starred in her movies, the movies that were based on her books, they disavowed her and distanced themselves as far away from her as possible because they don't want to get canceled too. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. It's a very public cancellation, but there are private cancellations too. And this is where each one of us can relate. I want to tell you the story of Anne Darwin. Anne Darwin is a woman, was, a, was a woman married to a man named John Darwin. And John Darwin was a, a pretty wealthy man, but he ran into some financial troubles. And he's a schemer. He's a bit of a narcissist and a schemer, and he mentally abused his wife, Anne Darwin, quite a bit. Well, when they went into some financial troubles, he concocted a crazy scheme to get themselves out of the financial problems. So he said, Anne, we're gonna go on a canoe trip, and we're gonna fake my death. We're gonna make it look like I drowned at sea. I was lost at sea, you don't know what happened to me, and all this stuff, so uh, we'll fake it like I, I got lost at sea. 
And then when we collect the insurance money, the life insurance money, we'll go live on a private beach somewhere in, I think, Belize or some uh, 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 Central American country where no one will know it's us and we can live happily ever after with all this money. Just tell the lie. I know they'll search for me. I know they'll spend thousands to do it, but just if you stay the course, I promise you, we'll get away with it. Reluctantly, she does it. She tells the lie. And thousands of dollars are spent with hundreds of man hours spent looking for her husband, John Darwin. Here's the kicker though. She had to tell her sons, her two sons, that their father was dead and had to maintain that lie for five years during the search. But then someone snapped a photo of her and John together on a beach and it was all over. The lie came crashing down. She was convicted of fraud. You know, you, tell, you hear her tell her story and she'll tell you that of all the things she was called, rightfully so, she, she admits, felon, con, convicted thief, fraudster, names I can't even mention to you here on the stage. Of all the names she was called, the one that almost drove her to end it all was the one her kids gave her because of the shame and humiliation they felt. Bad mother. Shame. She had become someone bad. She didn't do something bad. She had become someone bad. That is a very Western story with serious Eastern implications that I think Jesus can speak into as the Easterner who speaks East and West quite fluently. Jesus understands the, dynam the dynamics today. He understands how the, 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 I'll try it again. He understands how the dynamics work. When you look at the Bible and you look at it through Eastern eyes, you begin to see something about the way Jesus interacts with people. There's a great book called Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. Um, now, it's not wrong to read Scripture through Western eyes, but sometimes we have to make sure we can capture the Easternness by thinking of an, an Eastern way that the Bible actually was written, because it was written by Middle Easterners and Easterners. You see two things happening. You see a couple of things happening. Jesus engages publicly with people and privately with people. Now, you'll notice something. Whenever Jesus is asked a question in public, it's never to get information. It's always to play what scholars call the honor game. They want to humiliate Jesus. They want to give him a problem, give him an issue he can't resolve so that in front of the crowd, Jesus' honor level goes down and the questioner, those who challenged him, their honor level goes up. It's called the honor game. And you play it and the public uh, uh, questions are the way in which you play this game. But when you see people ask Jesus questions in, in private, that's when they really want answers to their questions. That's where sincerity happens in private. Let me give you an example of what I mean. So you recall the story in the Bible where the Sadducees come. Now the Sadducees are a group of Jews who don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in a resurrection at all. They think that when you die, you stay dead and that's it. So they know Jesus does believe in a resurrection. <clears throat> so they come to Jesus and they say, you know, Jesus, good teacher, they're buttering him up, of course. They say, you know, there was a man among us who was married. And before he had children, he died. And his wife married his brother, because that's the custom of the day. You marry the brother of, so you can carry on the bloodline of the family. And before that brother had children, he died. And so she married his other brother. And before that guy had, had children, he died. And this happened seven times, Jesus. She married seven people. So my question for you is this, Jesus. If there's a resurrection, whose wife will she be in the afterlife? That's not a serious question, that's a trick question. They weren't really seeing, you know, Jesus, we have this problem. We don't, we, can you help us understand your, your point of view? I wanna know what you mean, what you think, what you mean when you say resurrection. They weren't doing that. What they were saying was, your view is silly and we're gonna show everyone how stupid your view actually is. Now Jesus could respond with a lengthy explanation of the politics and the uh, economy of resurrection, but he doesn't. What he says is, you don't know the scriptures. And which is ironic because they knew it back and forth, but they didn't know the meaning of the scriptures. He says, you don't know the scriptures. In those days, they will neither be married nor given in marriage, but be like the angels. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, you ignoramuses. <laughs> now he didn't say those words because he's more tactful than that, but he did say that in meaning. 
He's pointing out, your intent is wrong. You're not actually after the truth. Now, what ended up happening in this particular instance is when he shows them that the scriptures really mean the opposite of what they think, their honor level went down in the eyes of the culture and his went up and they couldn't stand it anymore. And so the Bible has this curious phrase that follows a lot of these, these um, uh, interactions. They say, and they were astonished at his teaching. And then one phrase in particular stands out, and it says, and no one dared ask him any more questions. Now, this is funny in one sense because you're like, I get it, I, I know why. But then you read the Bible, then you see that they did ask him more questions. You're like, well, wait a minute, is that a contradiction? Does the Bible not know what it's talking about? The point is, they did ask him questions privately. No one dared ask him any more public questions because like a jujitsu master, Jesus used their momentum against them in public all the time. And so they asked him in private, think of Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus under cover of night and he asks him questions about what it means to be born again because Nicodemus wants an actual answer. But why did he come to him under cover of night? Why did he come to him in private? And the answer is this, because Nicodemus feared the authority of the Jews in the high council, even though he was a member of the high council, because he did not want to be put out of the synagogue. And they had already said that if anyone confesses Jesus to be the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. In other words, they would be canceled. The ultimate shame would be for you to no longer be able to go to the synagogue in that time. And they threatened that, they threatened cancellation. Sound familiar? Sounds like, sounds like today, exactly like today. So what you see in an Eastern paradigm is that public questions aren't really serious questions, they're an attempt at winning a game. Private questions are very, very serious. You know, I was at a uh, university, uh, sorry, an open forum at a facility, it was a big church, but it was an open forum where they invited skeptics to come uh, uh, in Calgary. Huge facility, and we had a large crowd. I was speaking on the topic of man's search for meaning. Can we find meaning without God, or do we need God to find objective purpose and meaning? And I gave the talk, and then we had Q&A afterwards. Now, there were two ways you could ask questions. You could ask the questions from the microphone in front of everybody, or you could send them in by text. And of course, there were, there were, there were a mixed crowd there. There were some Christians, of course, but there were lots of Muslims, lots of Hindus, lots of atheists in the crowd. And you could tell from the questions, of course. Now, what was interesting was the way the Easterners asked their questions. They would come to the microphone, those who were from the East, who weren't from a Christian perspective, and they would ask questions very brusquely and in a way that meant to challenge me. One particular question came from a Muslim guy, and he said, you tell me one place, even one place in the Bible, where Jesus says the words, I am God, worship me. Now, that's a trick question, because he knows Jesus never says those words in that way. So my response back to him was, is this an important issue for you? If I can show you where Jesus does claim to be God, will you become a Christian now? And can he say it the way he wants to say it? Does he have to say it your way? Or can he say it his own way? Now that was one exchange, but another question came from a Muslim, but this one came by text. And the question was, remember the topic, the topic was, can man have meaning without God? And the question was this, I'm a Muslim and I believe in God but I'm bored and I find my life to be meaningless. Why is that? A private question, an anonymous question, seeking a real answer. Because they weren't out to shame me, they weren't out to win honor, they just wanted an answer. And they asked it anonymously because of the fear of the shame that any expression of doubt might bring if others in the crowd saw who it was. Now you think about social media, and this happens all the time now. You ever see this on Twitter or anywhere else for that matter, where someone says, honest question, colon, and then they have a question. An honest question suggests that I want an actual answer, I really don't know the answer to my own question. And whenever you see honest question, colon, and then a question following it, you can be sure that 90% of the time, that question that follows the phrase honest question is not an honest question. <laughs> it's meant to look, make other people look like morons. Just like when people say the phrase, I don't want to offend you, but I'm going to. Like that kind of a thing. This is an Eastern thing. They did that back then. A public question was meant to win honor. A private question was meant to get an answer. And Jesus understood this and he dealt with it. Let me give you another example real quick and then I'll move on. 
because time runs a little on the short side and I've got so much I want to tell you, but I wrote a whole book about it. Um, <clears throat> J.K. Rowling was canceled for her statements on sex and gender. But she and others, other prominent writers, prominent comedians, prominent uh, into public intellectuals, saw what was coming. They saw the cancel culture as dangerous, and it is. And so they wrote a statement out about favoring free speech, even speech you don't like, because free speech includes everyone's speech, not just those who agree with you. And they said, a danger is coming, and we stand with free speech. And people from all walks of life, writers, actors, artists, scientists, you name it, they all signed this statement. Whether they were politically right, politically left, politically central, it didn't matter. They signed the statement because they believed in the content of the statement. But one particular writer, when she found out who it was who had signed the statement, that people who disagreed with her politically, including J.K. Rowling, had signed the statement, she says, I disavow this statement. I I wish I never signed it. I didn't know who it was who was signing the statement along with me. Do you see why that's curious? You agree with the substance of the statement, but because the people who signed it are the wrong kind of people, you suddenly abandon your strong stance on a fundamental moral issue. Because I'm not going to be canceled if they are. I'm too afraid. Too afraid. You know, you look at John chapter 9, and you see Jesus living and working in this field of cancellation and fear of it. So I'll tell you the story, because time doesn't permit me to get into the nitty-gritty of the scriptures themselves on this particular issue, but I'm going to quote them. The story goes like this. Jesus comes across a man who is, bo who is blind from birth, and he heals the man. Now, what's interesting about it, it's a young man. The scripture goes out of its way to say it's a young man. And so Jesus heals the young man by making mud. He spits in the ground, makes some mud, puts it on the man's eyes, and the man can see. Now, the question is this. It immediately should pop into your head. Why did he make mud? Because there's other times when he heals a man from blindness, and he doesn't make mud. Why make mud at this particular instance? And the answer is because Jesus is a troublemaker. Because he does it on a Sabbath day when you can't make anything or do any work. And he does it so the Pharisees will find out that he did this and create all big stir because he wants to engage with them. And so he heals the young man. The young man can see. He says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He goes and he washes in the pool of Siloam. Now the Pharisees get wind of this because the man is obviously just shouting for joy that he can finally see. This young kid can finally see. He no longer has to succumb to the shame of begging for his living. He can now earn his own living. And the Pharisees, rather than rejoice, are upset by this. Because who did the healing? It was Jesus. So they question people. They think maybe a scam is afoot. Because Jesus is a scammer after all. And maybe these parents and this kid are all involved in the scam. So they go to the parents and they say, is this your son for real? who you say was born blind. In other words, either he's not your son or he wasn't born blind. You're, a scam is going on here. And they're terrified now. They say, no, we know this is our son and we know he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. That's a lie. It's gotta be a lie. Are you telling me that your son, who is now sighted, didn't tell you who did it? You prayed your whole lives for this young man to see. And when he does, you're like, oh, that's curious. <laughs> and what do they do? They say, he is of age, go ask him. You know why they said that? It's a speculation on my part. But you know why they said he is of age? My guess is, it's because he looked young. And the reason he looked young was because he was. Probably barely over the age of accountability, probably barely over the age of 13. And they were so afraid, the scripture literally tells us that they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue, of being canceled. They were so afraid of that cultural honor being taken from them that they threw their teenage son to the wolves. And so they ask him, and he's not afraid of them at all. And he says, it was this, Jesus, why do you keep asking me? Do you want to be his disciple too? And they're upset about this. And so they cancel him. They put him out of the synagogue. And Jesus' honor and shame radar pings like crazy. And he goes back to the young man. And he says something remarkable to the young man. He says this to the man who was once blind who now sees. He says, I have come that those who thought they can see are now shown to be blind. But those who are blind can now see. In other words, whatever cultural honor these men can bestow upon you, 
and take away, I'm going to give you an honor of sight that no man can take from you because no man gave it to you. I can replace a cultural honor with the heavenly one only the Son of Man can give. Amen. And we need that. <laughs> Jesus speaks fluent across cultures. Let me give you one more, and then I'll move to an illustration, and then we'll finish. When you read the parable, and Jesus uses parables in such delightful ways, such delightful ways, it's so Eastern of him. You know, olive oil drips from every page of that book. It really does. You hear the parable in Matthew chapter 20, verses one to 16. And Jesus is giving a parable, for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, we do this today. He's looking to hire day laborers, guys who wait outside and wanna know, can I get a job today? I, I'm, I, I, I'm good with my hands. Give me a job so I can earn money for my family today. It's a day laborer position. We do this today. You go to Home Depot, you'll see somebody, I'll see a crowd of guys, maybe drywallers or rough carpenters or plumbers or whoever it might be, who, looking, who are looking for a general contractor to hire them for the day and say, hey, you need some work? Come on with me. I'll give you some labor for the day. Now, what happens in these particular moments is that the, the, the person hires who they need and that's it, it's over in the morning, it's done. You don't go back at noon because no one's there. No one's hiring, so you go home, if you don't get hired, dejected, because you didn't earn a day's wage that day. And you have to go back to your family and say, sorry, no money today, no food. That happened in Jesus' day, here it is. Verse two, after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius, that's important, put a pin in that, he agreed with them for a denarius, a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. The third hour, he shouldn't have done that, but he did it. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first, so that the first guys will see the last guys get paid. It's clever. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius, the same pay as the first guys who worked all day. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with, the thing, with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last shall be first and the first last. This is an important parable, and you get the whole story. He hires people in the beginning, he agrees with them for the denarius. He goes back a second, a third, a fourth, and even a fifth time until there's one hour left of work in the day, and he hires people. He shouldn't have done that, because you always hire who you need in the beginning, and you don't go back a second, third, fourth, especially not a fifth time. But he finds people waiting there over and over again, hoping to get work that day, and he pays them all the same wage. Now, I remember a Christian pointing this out to me and said, read this parable. And when I, was a, when I was a Muslim, I wasn't even a Christian yet. And I read it and the first thing I thought of, this is patently unfair. This is how grace works? This is unfair. And then my Middle Easternness suddenly just sort of came alive in me. 30 seconds into my objection, the answer came to me because of my Middle Eastern perspective of an honor and shame culture. I suddenly saw, among the many things that are going on in this parable, one very important aspect. Why did the men wait? They shouldn't have waited. There was no hope of them getting work because they feared the shame of going home to their families empty-handed. And the master of the vineyard comes and he sees their faith. They are holding out hope that someone will honor them. And he sees that and he asks them, why are you waiting? And they say, because no one's honored us yet. And then he gives them a job. He could have given them charity, but he didn't. He gave them a job. He dignified them with work. Here's the kicker. 
They were waiting around to be honored, holding out hope that they wouldn't go home in shame. And the master of the vineyard sees them and he credits their faith that someone would honor them as if it was actual work. That's why he paid them the same amount of money he paid the other guys who did the work. And one can only think of Abraham who waited around for the promise of Isaac to be born, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness. Isn't it amazing the way the Bible from Genesis to the New Testament coheres in itself. It has the same message no matter who's writing the story. Amen. Honor and shame. You see, he can replace your fear of shame with a divine and heavenly honor. But then you see something amazing happen here. You see how Jesus not only speaks an honor and shame culture, but he speaks to a Western culture as well, or a philosophical mind. He speaks to the heart and the honor and shame, but he also speaks philosophy as well. What is one of the chief struggles in theology or in philosophy when we think of God and humanity? We think, how can human beings be responsible for their actions and their free choices if God knows and does everything and he controls everything. If God is sovereign, how can human beings have a moral free will? We ask this question all the time. The parable answers it. Did you see what happened? Did you catch it? So the men who were hired first agree with the vineyard owner for a denarius a day. That is a good, a good amount of pay for them. It's a fair wage. Now at the end, when everyone gets the same denarius, they get upset and they say, hey, wait a minute, we wanted more. And what does the master of the vineyard say? He says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me for the denarius? Can't I be generous to what I have? In other words, I can give to who I want. That's God's sovereignty. Didn't you agree for denarius? That's human free will. One parable, multiple truths. Jesus speaks across cultures and he speaks across time. Let me close with an illustration from today to show you just how timeless this message actually is. Leslie Newbigin calls Jesus our eternal contemporary. That's a beautiful phrase, eternal contemporary. He's always current even though he's ancient. Who can forget the Monica Lewinsky scandal of the 90s? I was in law school when it happened. <clears throat> President Clinton had an affair with an intern named Monica Lewinsky while he was in office, while he was married. And there was a whole rigmarole behind it about other things that had happened and all this, and he denied the affair. He denied it. And you remember the statement he made on national television when he says, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. That woman. What a weird thing to say. But you can see why he said it. It was dismissive. It made her into the sole villain of the story in order to sort of escape it himself and absolve him of any moral turpitude in the situation. That woman, so dismissive. Now, none of those two words, that or woman, are offensive. When put together with that tone, it's an insult. Monica Lewinsky gave a TED talk, and I saw it on a plane while I was flying on Delta, and the reason I saw it on a plane is because I fly a lot, and I've watched pretty much everything Delta had to offer up to that point that was worth watching and appropriate for me to watch, so I was left with TED Talks. Um, if, if you're part of the TED organization, I'd love to talk for you. Don't, don't, don't take offense to that. Um, no, uh, uh, she gave a brilliant TED Talk, actually, on the whole culture of humiliation. Now, this happened to her, this whole thing with the, with the, with the Clinton uh, administration happened to her well before Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all these things, well before that. But there was still an internet and there was still email and all that stuff going on. And so she was publicly shamed uh, all the time. And the level of humiliation that was happening, it wasn't her guilt over what she had done, although that was bad enough. It was the shame she was enduring from people who she knew were no more virtuous than herself telling her how horrible she was. And it was that shame of living with that identity now that almost caused her to take her own life. And this is what she says. There are no perimeters around how many people can be publicly, sorry, there are no perimeters around how many people can publicly observe you and put you in a public stockade. This shift has created what Professor Nicholas Mills calls a culture of humiliation. I was branded a tramp, a tart, a few other names that, you know, I can't say here. And of course, that woman. I was seen by many, but actually known by few. And I get it, it was easy to forget that that woman was dimensional, had a soul, and was once unbroken. 
When you, you hear her say that. All the insults others had called her were bad enough, but the thing that really chained her heart to the floor was being called that woman. So dismissive, so demoralizing, so shameful, amazing. Jesus understands her and the interplay of guilt and innocence. He understands Anne Darwin, who was guilty of fraud, but shamed for being a bad mother. He understands the man born blind, who received heavenly honor, but was culturally shamed. He understands the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who had ethnic, moral, and otherwise tons of baggage that shamed her, and she was canceled, but he offered her a place in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus understood them. You see, the reason why it's a cancel culture at all, the reason why there's so much rancor and anger and vitriol and bile in our culture today is because we're all striving to be understood, but we take no time to understand. And yet it's Jesus, the one who made you and fashioned you, who not only understands you, but can get you to understand who he is and who others are as well at the same time. I'm reminded of Thomas Bracken's poem, Not Understood where he says, not understood, we move along asunder, our paths grow wider as the seasons creep. Along the years, we marvel and we wonder why life is life and then we fall asleep, not understood. Not understood, how many breasts are aching, how many, for lack of sympathy, uh, day by day, how many lonely, cheerless hearts are breaking, how many noble spirits pass away, not understood. And then he, he pleads out to God and he says, oh God, that men would see a little clearer, or at least judge less harshly when they cannot see, O God, that men would draw a little nearer to one one another. Perhaps they would draw nearer to thee and then be understood. We're longing to be understood. It is only Christ who understands East and West, who understands first century and 2020. It's only Christ who understands what it means to feel shame and want honor. It's only Christ himself who paid the debt so that we would no longer be guilty of sin. It is Christ alone who endured the shame and despised the shame for the joy of seeing us honored because we are imputed to his honor. Honor and shame, guilt and innocence, East and West come together in one place. It's the cross where all things converge. Amen. Amen. Anne Darwin. Anne Darwin has found healing. She's found healing because her sons and her are reconciled. She is no longer a bad mother. She's a felon. She's a convicted felon. She's a thief all these things, and she's paid her debt. But in her children's eyes, she's no longer the shame-filled bad mother. She is honored as the one who has come clean and has become clean. Isaac Watts shows us just how wonderful the scriptures actually are when he bases his hymn on Psalm 25. He says, the Lord is just and kind, the meek shall learn his ways, and every humble sinner find the methods of his grace. For his unrighteous sake, he saves my soul from shame. He pardons, though my guilt be great, in my Redeemer's name. If you're struggling with the shame, and you need that honor, Christ can give it. If you're struggling with the guilt, and you want to be made innocent, Christ has done it. May you know him, may you share him. This culture needs him. I bid you to share him with the world that desperately needs him. May you have a clear vision and see him afresh and get the world to see him afresh once again. Thank you so much for your time. God bless you.